Hi, I'm Shana Merlin, and I want to teach your doctor how to be really good at making stuff up on the spot. Strange, right? Well, let me explain. It starts with the story of my son, Maxwell. This is Max. I know, adorable, right? <laughs> I made him with my body. Pretty cool. The thing is, when Max was born in 2014, he failed his newborn hearing screening. In fact, he failed all three of his newborn hearing screenings, and things got pretty serious pretty fast. We had to go to a bunch of different specialists to find out what was going on with Max. I have a specific memory of pulling into my driveway in my powder blue Honda Odyssey minivan with the push button sliding doors and getting a call from our pediatric ear, nose, and throat doctor. She was gonna have the answers to the questions I'd been churning about. Could Maxwell hear? Would I be able to talk with him? Would we need to spend him, send him to a special school? Would we need to learn sign language? I picked up the call and she had a diagnosis. She started talking to me about enlarged vestibular aqueducts and moderate sensory neural hearing loss and I was drowning. <laughs> I could not understand what she was saying. In this moment, I wasn't the communication skills expert I am in my career. I was a mom of an infant and a two-year-old, and I was alone, and I was scared, and I was exhausted, and my brain could barely work. And all I could think about was, what did this mean for Max and his future? And how in the world was I going to walk into my house and explain all of this to Max's dad and Max's grandmother? Well, a few weeks later, we saw a second pediatric ENT. And this was like night and day, this experience. I remember pushing Max's green stroller into that office with his big stack of all the test results we'd gotten. And that doctor spoke immediately to the question that had burning in my heart. He said, here's what you need to know. Max can hear and he'll always be able to hear. <sighs> And after some reassurance in simple everyday language, I was able to breathe, to come up for air and start to understand the details of his diagnosis. And of course, what this doctor meant was that Max had some natural hearing and that with hearing aids or other medical interventions, he would be able to hear and I would be able to talk to my son. Now I'm guessing a lot of you have had experiences like this when you go to the doctor. You leave feeling unheard or confused about what exactly your diagnosis is and what your treatment plan is. And this isn't just an inconvenience, it's harmful. It turns out that the way medical professionals are trained and the way their work environments are set up, it makes it almost impossible for them to connect with the patients that are right there in front of them. This lack of presence has created a crisis in compassion in medicine and it's hurting patients, it's hurting doctors, and it's hurting hospitals. In a study by the Orsini Way, 71% of us say we experience a lack of compassion when we're with our healthcare provider. 73% of us feel rushed when we're at the doctor's office. You might say, well, we don't go to the doctor to make friends, we go there to get better. But this lack of compassion, it hurts patient outcomes. For example, if you're a diabetes patient, and you go to see a doctor that scores low on an empathy scale, you are 40% more likely to have severe complications. And this is tough for doctors too. Doctors are burnt out. 40 to 54% report experiencing burnout. 44% of medical students experience burnout before they even get to their residency. And this lack of compassion hurts hospitals in their bottom line. Hospitals with low patient experience scores make on average 3% less than hospitals that score high on patient experience scores. And with COVID-19, these challenges are even greater. Now that exhausted physicians are trying to communicate with patients through masks, shields, and screens with telemedicine. To combat all of this, I'm working with students at the University of Texas, Austin in the Dell Medical School. I'm teaching them the tools of presence and compassion alongside fantastic doctors like Dr. Rob Millman, Dr. John Luke, and Dr. Dan Richards. And I like to start 
by telling them the story of Max. Thankfully, through medical interventions, Max's hearing was restored. But Max is not the only one in that story who has difficulty with hearing. It turns out that we need to get out of our heads and into the moment so we can focus on the people in front of us and start to think, what do they understand? What do they care about? What are the obstacles they're facing? That level of pre presence, that level of presence is the foundation of compassionate care. Now I, to my parents' great disappointment, am not a doctor. I am an improv comedian. Improv is making up songs or dances, scenes or stories, art or music on the spot inspired by audience suggestion. I have an improv comedy school here in Austin, and I've been working with professionals in all sorts of fields using the tools and techniques from the world of improvisational theater to help them be better team members, better communicators, and just more fun to work with. I've been working with medical professionals for the past five years to teach them these improv tools of presence and compassion. Now, you might be thinking, why in the world would I want my doctor to be an improviser? I don't want to have my surgeon just be like, hmm, maybe we'll cut you like this today. Ha ha. That is not at all the kind of medical improv I am talking about. But let's take that surgery example. Let's say you are unconscious on the operating table. You have a great surgeon with a well thought out, proven medical uh, surgical plan. They cut you open and something unexpected is there. Do you want a surgeon then who will follow the plan and stick with the plan? Or do you want someone who is present enough to take in new information? flexible enough to adjust their plan, and present enough to communicate that plan in real time with their team members. I think in those moments, you do want an improviser as a doctor. Or more commonly, in the situation I had with Max, where someone's trying to communicate a difficult diagnosis, do you want a doctor who can get list every fact of that diagnosis in their head? Or do you want a doctor that can express empathy and compassion and make sure you understand your treatment plan and what's gonna happen to you or your child? If Max's doctor had had these improv skills, she might've been able to offer me some compassion instead of just explanation. That's why I believe improv skills are medical skills. Improv skills are medical skills. And the most important time to teach these skills is when medical students are transitioning from classroom learning to clinical learning. It turns out that the skills medical students use in classroom learning, the competitiveness, the perfectionism, the caution, all those things that have helped them succeed up to that point are the opposite of the skills that are gonna help them succeed in clinical learning. In clinical learning, we want them to work as a team. We want them to be open to trying new things. We want them to be eager to solicit and accept feedback. These are the improv skills that can help our medical students be better doctors while they're still under the supervision and safety of attending physicians. And this is not just for medical students. I had a physician attendee come up to me after a training at Methodist Medical Center in Dallas. And he said, I love the training. Uh, we do a lot of continuing medical education and I learn more about a specific prescription or a pre specific procedure and maybe I use that with one out of every 20 patients. But this improv training, I use it with every patient encounter, every interprofessional encounter. I had another training at the Austin Regional Clinic and a physician, a family medicine doctor came up to me afterwards and she said, I love the training, I've taken improv classes, I use it all the time in my practice and my patients love it. I said, what do you do? She said, well, after they come in and tell me what brought them there, I say, and what else? And then I let them talk. <laughs> and then when they're done, I say, and what else? And let them finish talking. She and I knew she was using this improv tool of yes and, of accepting someone's ideas and expanding upon it. I bet you're wondering, well, how exactly do you do improv with medical students? And I wanna show you an example of how I do this. For this, I'm gonna need an audience volunteer. Uh, can I get a volunteer? Yes. Hi, my name is Alif. 
Hi, Alif. I'm Shayna, and we're going to play a little bit of sound ball. Um, how this works is I have this ball with me. I take it wherever I go, and when I throw it to you, it makes a sound. Ready? Woohoo! And when you catch it, it makes the same sound. Woohoo! Beautiful. Great. Now you're going to open your mouth and throw a sound back at me. Any sound you like. Booba! Booba! Cha cha! Cha cha! Doo doo! Doo doo! Woohoo! Woohoo! Meat ma! Meat ma! Oh, um, num num num. Delicious. Great. Beautiful. Thank you, Alif, everybody. Alif. Great. So you got to experience a little bit of sound ball, a game I've done with thousands of participants. And I like to ask them afterwards, what um, what's going on in your head when you're playing sound ball? So what, was it, what were you thinking? Instead of listening to the sound you were making as much, I was a bit more in my head focusing on the sound that I was going to make. So I was a bit more removed from, I think, the interaction that was happening. So you were experiencing being in your head, thinking ahead about what you're going to do, and um, feeling kind of removed from the situation. I get that feedback a lot. When people are put on the spot, they're often thinking ahead. Why? Well, because we don't want to look dumb or say the wrong thing or take too long. So we're very busy planning ahead about what we're going to do. But when we're planning ahead, we're not in the moment. We're in the future. And if we're planning ahead that much about what sound we're going to make, imagine how much we're planning ahead when we're trying to explain a difficult diagnosis or hand off a complex patient at the end of a long shift. Soundball reminds us of how difficult it is to be present in the moment. And that's why we need to teach these improv skills to doctors so they can practice being more present and compassionate with their patients. Soundball is just one of many tools that we're using with the medical students. We're practicing mirroring to send signals of similarity and blend with our patients so we can build rapport and relationship and that foundation of compassionate care. We've been practicing the failure bow, taking responsibility for our mistakes if we can, laughing them off and letting them go and trying again to build resiliency, increase joy, and reduce burnout. We've been playing group juggle, tossing lots of balls in the air as a medical team and not dropping a single one to make sure that our communications are clear and complete. We've even been making paper airplanes, trying to improve their design quickly so we can practice iterative processes for patient safety improvement. There's a lot of benefits to this kind of training. Patients that experience a therapeutic alliance with their healthcare providers experience less pain. Doctors who show more compassion for their patients are burnt out less, not more. And hospitals where there's strong relationships and communication with their patients have a lower rate of malpractice saving everyone a lot of cash. So if you believe that these improv skills are medical skills and can help our healthcare system, what can you do? Well, if you're a patient, fill out those annoying surveys you get at the end of a hospital stay or a doctor's visit. Those, you know, tell your healthcare provider whether they're being compassionate or not, because those surveys impact how much hospitals get reimbursed by Medicare. This is very interesting to hospitals, and they are motivated to make sure that their health healthcare providers have high patient experience scores. So motivated, they might hire me to teach their doctor soundball. If you're a healthcare provider, you probably already have really strong skills in thinking ahead and planning for the future. I want to invite you to work on those present skills. They might be weak and fatigue quickly, but over time, if you practice, they will get stronger and be there for you when you need them. And if you're in leadership at a hospital or a medical office or a medical school, teach your people compassion. Now, you can teach compassion a lot of ways, through mindfulness and meditation, through yoga or journaling. I just happen to think that improv is a lot faster and a lot more fun. This year will be the first graduating class of medical students at Dell Medical School. And all of them will have received at least 10 hours of improv training. So the hope is if one of them is your doctor, instead of feeling overwhelmed and inundated with a wave of information that leaves you drowning like I did, you're gonna feel like you have someone present with you by your side 
to help see you through, healing you inside and out. And Mr. Max, well, he's doing pretty great too. He'll be turning seven this year, and I'll let him tell you himself how he's doing. Guess what I learned how to do? I can now ride my bike without training wheels and also swim. Thank you.